Um, my name is Sam. Uh, I'm a research fellow at the University of Leeds um, doing criminology, geography related type research, um, mainly sometimes in collaboration or, or working with police force data. So that's a lot of what we're going to be working with today. Police data is not perfect, but it has a lot of interesting advantages for teaching because it's often spatial, like they often have coordinate data about where things happen. Um, and it's also temporal in the sense you can look at things over time. So I, that's, I spent a lot of my time, probably too much time dealing with data like that. Um, but that's kind of what we'll be focusing on today. But a lot of the skills, the visualization, the mapping skills that we'll be looking at, they are basically generic, which sounds like a insult to what we're doing but actually i do think generic skills are like a, an excellent thing and you can more or less apply them to anything um but yeah you can you can any questions you have throughout the day or tomorrow or after the workshop you can email me um and there's also contact details on my website or if you're nosy about my background or something you can you can uh, look at that um all the material today well, okay, so some of the material is on the Dropbox. Um, so you should have had access to the Dropbox yesterday. Um, and there's now, there's day two and day three. So on the Dropbox, hopefully you can see me cycling through the Dropbox webpage. When you click on the data visualization, there's a data folder, which is the, the data that we're gonna be using today. And then there's a PDF of the slides that I will be going through. Um, and the same is true for tomorrow for the mapping. So if you want to look at the slides on your own laptop, uh, that's absolutely fine. Or you can skip ahead if you want to. The actual worksheets for now, I've put them online. Um, so there is a web link here. So the, the shortened web, web link is rpubs.com slash Langton underscore. Um, and of course, if you get the slides from the Dropbox, you can just click on the link easily. When you go on that link, there are three separate worksheets that I've created for today. Um, so yeah, number one worksheet graphics. It's the, the idea is that we go through that today. If you want to skip ahead, that's completely fine because I know people have uh, different, different experiences. But the idea is that we do the graphics worksheet today, the maps one, number two, tomorrow, and then the extras probably later on tomorrow once you've familiarized yourself with the graphics and the maps. Um, but the purpose of me giving you these now is that you have time to go through them in your own time, whether it's to go back in time to check something or um, to skip ahead if you're feeling super confident. Um, I can't see the link at the bottom because of Zoom, but there should be a link to GitHub there uh, where it says material. So whether you use GitHub or not, uh, I don't know, I, some of you might do. If you're interested in downloading the material on GitHub that way, you're, you're more than welcome. Um, completely up to you, whatever you're comfortable with. But just with the Dropbox and the RPUBS link, you should have everything for today. Um, okay, so structure of today is more or less what it was yesterday, I think. I am just going to talk and give a presentation for the next sort of 45 minutes or so. I will try and not make it exclusively uh, slides uh, because I don't want to completely exhaust people. I will do a little bit of presenting on the slides and then do a little bit of stuff in our studio. Um, then we have a break at 11 and then there's the practical, which is hopefully the idea in theory is that you go to that RPUBS link and you work through that graphics worksheet. So if I click on it, you'll see there's like a contents page focusing on ggplot2, which is the main, basically what we're gonna be doing for two days. Various different examples of what we're doing. Um, and then there's some extra resources at the end. It's very long. It looks like horribly long and you might be quite worried about it, but there's a lot of, obviously there's a lot of visuals. I reckon half of it, if not more, is just visuals. So you can work your way through that. And periodically I will probably uh, answer questions and also just, if I randomly think of something that is hopefully interesting for you, then I will butt in and just begin talking about it. Um, Yes, then we've got lunch break and then we've got the uh, like guest sort of presentation to finish off. Um, does anyone have any questions on that? I've already seen some chat related stuff. Okay, that's not for me, that's good. Okay, so data visualization in general. So 
I think we all know intuitively what data visualization is, but I think it's quite useful to try and like step back and have a think about it before we even begin doing any R. Mm. So the guy called Andy Kirk, who's like the data viz uh, expert and all round motivating and nice person. Um, he describes it, so it's a visual representation and presentation of data to facilitate understanding. Um, so that probably aligns with what most people think intuitively. Um, I think to, to borrow words of, there's a guy called John Byrne Murdoch, who I will refer to constantly today because he's a like, very uh, just talented uh, data visualization person for the FT, and he uses R for almost everything, I think. Um, I mean, he's described it like data visualization is an act of communication. It's just, a, it's basically a method for conveying information. So that information might be um, like some results that you've come up with from very complex analysis. And you basically, you wanna convey that information to people in a way that is understandable. So they understand the data that's underlying the visualization. They enjoy the visualization. Like it's not sort of horrible to look at. It's like, you know, it's, it conveys the information but it's also enjoyable to look at. And then also importantly, and this is something I wouldn't think of, but John Byrne Murdoch has mentioned, is that ideally visualization should be quite memorable as well. So you're representing information in a way that people understand, they enjoy, and they're actually going to remember and retain uh, for the future. So, you know, so for, if you're an academic, you want people to be able to talk about your research in the future. So if you can give them a visualization that they understand and they, they remember, they're more likely going to be able to recall that and talk about and share with other people. So data visualization in R, um, th this is just a random selection of visualizations that the BBC use. So the BBC, a lot of their visualizations actually use R um, and they actually have a lot of teaching material for R as well, uh, which I can share with people. Um, but you know, these are just examples of, of, of communicating information to people. So the top left thing is obviously quite relevant for today because we're talking about crime. So that's um, homophobic hate crimes, I think in the United Kingdom. Um, so you've got information about the victims, the suspects, the age group, um, the time span that we're talking about. So there's this underlying data, probably from police recorded data, or maybe from a survey or court victims, very complex data that involve lots of filtering and selecting and joining, just like you did yesterday. And the person has basically said, oh, how can we convey this information in a way that people will actually understand and enjoy? Um, we've also got some political examples. So I think that's the, uh, is that the German parliament maybe? I don't know, Sweden Democratic, so like the, yeah, election results. And of course, rather than just doing it in a bar plot or something, we've actually come up with this kind of figurative uh, array of seating in the parliament, which is quite a cool way of showing it. Um, you've got the temporal, uh, temporal aspects of data in the bottom left uh, about Brexit. So they've kind of made it look like a calendar. Um, obviously quite an intuitive way to think about time for most people because people are used to looking at cal calendars. And then the bottom right, of course, we have maps, which are widely, widely used in political contexts and in sociology and in criminology and pretty much any field you can think of. But also, um, I would say relatively straightforward to make in R, as hopefully you'll see tomorrow, but not an easy way to not an easy way to visualize data in general. You know, there's lots and lots of challenges with visualizing geographic data that you don't have with normal data. Uh, but we'll discuss that a bit later. But the point is, okay, you see these visuals all the time, and every single time you're looking at this visual visualization and consuming the information, you're uh, hopefully having this reaction of understanding the underlying data, enjoying it, and hopefully remembering it for the future if it's a good visualization that is. Um, so I, would just, I just wanted to quickly go through like some examples of data visualization that I think is quite good um, and, and or influential visualizations, both crime and non-crime related before we even begin to, to look at our related stuff. So you, people might actually know this already. So this is by this John Byrne Murdoch guy. Um, and he, he is, he's become even more prominent in the past year because he has been using um, a lot of skills in R, including ggplot, to visualize um, and track the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and these visuals have, are, are like very, very powerful and, and they've almost been influential enough 
you know, that internationally they're very in, uh, influential. Um, and yeah, it's, I think it's just a fantastic example of portraying, of conveying a lot of information uh, in a very uh, sort of concise and powerful way. Um, and you might see, if you go on, uh, if you Google something like COVID FT tracker, hopefully you can still see my screen. Like this web page is now free. FT is behind a paywall, but this web page is free. And all this information uh, is, there's a huge amount of data handling that's gone behind this information, um, gone behind these visuals, sorry. Uh, but he's using tools like ggplot to convey that information in a way that is very enjoyable for people, even if it's quite a morbid topic, and saying enjoyable is a bit weird, uh, but it's very, very powerful um, and you know, very widely circulated internationally. And these skills are exactly the skills that we'll learn today, if that's motivating for people, even though it's a morbid topic. Um, yeah, mapping is another great one. Uh, this, this is, again, is a skill we're going to learn tomorrow. So, of course, we're going to learn how to make maps. But this is what's called a bivariate scale map, I think, where basically you're mapping two variables at once. So, on the if you look on the bottom left, you've got greater health deprivation, and Zoom is ruining my enjoyment of this visual because I can't see it, but I think it's uh, something like the risk in the population of, of COVID. Again, huge amounts of information in this. You've got information about health, in, information about age, uh, deprivation, lots of different stuff underlying it, and also two different variables all in one map of Greater Manchester. And that's also quite a powerful way to, to visualize stuff. Same guy, Colin Angus has been, uh, this is basically tracking the temporal relationship and temporal spread of COVID throughout the UK. I think these are local authorities. Um, yeah, I mean, it speaks for itself, I guess. You, you can, you can I don't, I'm not 100% sure how they're ordered. I guess it's just ordered of first contact with COVID or something like that. But this is the kind of thing, you, I mean, as soon as you look at that visualization, you are seeing a pattern. Uh, you know, within within two or three seconds of looking at the visualization, you see that there's an underlying pattern to it, and you can consume and understand a huge amount of information very, very quickly when information is portrayed like this. Much more than if it's in a table, uh, which is like you know blasphemy to a lot of visualization people. <laughs> uh, interactive stuff in R is also quite good. We're not going to cover interactive stuff today, but I'm happy to tomorrow if people are interested in it. Um, so this visual was done by Trafford Data Lab, um, which is, is kind of like the data science bit of Trafford Council. It's quite a heavy web page, so hopefully this is not going to crash my Zoom. Um, and hopefully you can see that. But basically, if interactive dashboard of stuff like deprivation, um, various different dimensions of deprivation, like income, employment, all stuff like that, crime, including crime. And every time we click on this kind of thing, it's probably like querying an API or something like that. And it updates interactive map. We've got a bar chart there. We're gonna look at deprivation data in Greater Manchester today, actually. Um, but again, just a great example of, uh, you know, using data visualization to increase, I would say like public, you know, it's basically local accountability to local government, I would say. Accountability to statistics and, you know, um, it's like democratizing data, this kind of dashboard to me, that the public can look at uh, open data in an, in an accessible way about the local area. So, you know, very important stuff. Uh, I will periodically, very self-indulgently, use examples from my own work. Uh, <laughs> I, I, that, that's why I didn't introduce myself too much at the beginning, because otherwise I just talk about myself constantly. Um, but I did the, this is an example of uh, different mapping techniques. So this was, the reason why this was quite odd is because it was designed to be a poster. So I think this is like 60 centimeters high and like 40 centimeters wide or something. Um, but yes, I did, I did this to basically show how you can visualize depri neighborhood deprivation in England in various different ways. Um, so if you click on this link at the bottom in the PDF, you go to the more high detailed version of it. But the idea being when you map uh, things like deprivation, often areas that are highly deprived, the neighborhoods are geographically quite small because deprived neighborhoods tend to be very densely populated. And the way in which we design neighborhoods in England means that very wealthy, like if you look at a map of wealth or something in England, 
geographically on the map, everything looks like England is very wealthy, but that's just because rural regions are very large and rural regions tend to are often wealthier regions. So mapping can be very uh, misleading in that respect. Uh, but there are various different ways of visualizing it using uh, like hexagrams type maps or grid type maps or dawling maps, if people have heard of these. Again, we do deal with stuff like that tomorrow. Um, but that's just an example of like, okay, you don't, when you're mapping stuff out, you don't have to use uh, the raw underlying data. You can do it in various different cool ways. Um, visualization doesn't even have to be to investigate a particularly uh, serious social science topic. So th this is a, a very, I always think this reminds me of the shape of whales for some reason, but th this is a visualization that basically, I think it's called the random pi walk. Uh, so I'm not a mathematician, so I'm not gonna go into it in too much detail, but obviously the number pi is a number to infinite numbers of decimal places. And basically this visualization person has um, generated basically a scheme where I think like zero was at 12 o'clock, one was at, you know, zero going all the round to nine goes around a clock like this. And so I don't know what the number is, but if it starts with like 0 0.3 something, then the first walk goes like this. And then basically you end up walking a random direction, not a random direction, but you end up walking in the direction of whatever the number of pi is. And you end up with this quite incredible uh, visualization of like, if I'd walked this route in real space and tracked where I'd gone, this is what you'd end up like. So of course it's kind of like a trivial topic, but for someone who might be want to, want to be interested in maths or something like that, you're conveying a number to millions of decimal places uh, with one visualization in a way that is basically artwork to me. This is like bridging the barrier between maths and arts. So it's a very, very cool thing, very, very cool thing to do. And also I'm 99% sure that Nadine, the person who did this graphic, I think she did it in ggplot as well, because that kind of thing you have to do computationally. You're not going to uh, use like paint or something in order to draw something like this. So you have to do it computationally. Crime data specifically um, is becoming, I, I think because in criminology and social science in general, people are becoming much more familiar with uh, with, with, with coding or with software in general. So I think that uh, stuff like ggplot and visualization in general is becoming increasingly used. And it shows as well, you know, when you go to, when you watch presentations, like either by uh, police forces or governments, but also academic conferences, like to me, the most powerful presentations by criminology or crime science researchers are, are the visual ones. And, and they're the ones that keep people engaged. Um, so this, this was a paper by uh, Matt Ashby, who's at UCL. Um, I think this paper, he was looking at how weather might predict uh, crime victimization in the United States. So they've uh, got five different cities down, you can see on the right hand side. Um, and I think the red estimate is, uh, I think, outdoor crime and the blue one is indoor crime. I think it's something like that. But the point is he, he's conducted some very like complex regression analysis. Lots of data handling has gone behind this. Um, lots of different uh, statistical techniques have gone behind this, but he's conveyed a huge amount of information that could have been a horrible, horrible table that either people wouldn't have understood the table or if they'd seen the table, they would have been instantly turned off by it. But he's portray portrayed these, these estimates in a very accessible way and in a way that people enjoy and in a way that people will probably remember as well. Um, just a small, just that small bridge from the table to the visualization can have quite a big impact. This is, um, I guess, a less colorful visualization, but I think an equally powerful one by uh, Rika, who's a lecturer at the University of Manchester. Um, so she did um, some research using Twitter data, uh, basically looking, I think it's basically looking at, um, so Greater Manchester Police specifically, they often tweet when there is a missing person. Um, and it was basically looking at to what extent people actually share these tweets that Greater Manchester Police put out. Because Greater Manchester Police put, put out the tweet and sometimes they put a photograph and sometimes they don't of the person that's missing. And she's basically interested in, okay, what does having the photograph impact whether people share, share the tweets? 
and does actually the content of the photograph affect whether people uh, share the tweet? Uh, again, a lot of, you know, you, you have to, uh, I don't know, query the twi Twitter API or, or scrape data from Twitter somehow. You have to clean it all, you have to handle it, you have to analyze it. A lot of, a lot of work has gone behind that, but then the results are like, basically you do justice to all that work by betraying um, the results in this way. A lot, of, a lot of information is behind this graphic and you get it, you get it across to people uh, in, in a powerful way. So I think that's another good example, but just not colorful, but it shows that black and white visuals can also be quite powerful, I think. This one is more colorful, which is good. So this goes back to the mapping type thing. Um, again, this visual will have used ggplot, the skill we're gonna to learn today and tomorrow. This is basically number of crime incidences in downtown San Francisco, I think. Um, yeah, so we've embedded a satellite image from Google Maps as sort of the first layer of the graphic. And then we've got these, I guess they're grid cells or, or raster cells or something like that to betray uh, crime hotspots. Uh, another example of crime mapping. So this is Ian, who is a, I think he's an, uh, an analyst at Essex Police. I think he might correct me on that, but I'm pretty sure he is. Um, and he, yeah, he's a big R user, and he basically correlated a lot of different data to create interactive dashboards that the police actually use for uh, deploying resources around places like Colchester. So again, it's kind of similar to the Trafford Data Lab map because you can tick things off and zoom in and look at various different things. But of course, this is quite useful when you want to identify um, like spike locations, like if a new pub opens, or a new shop opens or a gas station opens or closes for that matter. Um, and you want to identify the trends for the past couple of weeks to not to try and necessarily predict what's going to happen, but just try and uh, identify areas that are currently problematic uh, and maybe I guess maybe problematic in the future as well. Um, yeah, it's a very cool practical example of it. You know, it's not just an academic thing. Uh, I, just talking about myself again, um, <laughs> this is a paper that I did in the past few months are basically about the impact of the, of, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on crime. Um, the reason why I put this one up specifically is because a very important aspect of data visualization is communicating uncertainty. So whether you're doing statistics that of course uh, most of the time estimate things or summarize things rather than necessarily giving you all the information or whether you're making predictions about something like we did here, um, you have to ideally try and communicate that uncertainty in the visual. Uh, you don't, when you people look, you, you want to convey a message and you want to communicate to people and you, and you, want a, you want it to be powerful, but there's a very fine line between presenting something like an advert to try and sort of persuade people and then potentially misleading people by not showing the uncertainty in, in what your, uh, what you're betraying. Like a good example of this I've seen is everyone always talks about the R number during the COVID-19 pandemic. And for example, a lot of the headlines will say, okay, the R number is currently 0.9, or they'll say the R number is 1.4 or something like that. And what they very, very rarely say, or they very rarely show in, or, well, not rarely show, they don't always show in visuals or uh, in text is that when people say the R number is 0.9, there's always uncertainty around that number. Um, so I don't know if people know David Spiegelhalter. Um, I think he's an academic at Cambridge, but he's like sort of superstar statistician person and he's written quite a few books on it. He's, or he, he in particular is always very keen to point out that when people say a particular number or yeah, sh show a particular statistic, there's always uncertainty, or there's generally uncertainty around it. Uh, so that's something you might want to think of in, in your visuals. Like here we have like the confidence interval around the, what we expected to happen during the pandemic. Um, many people for the sake of simplicity might not have included that shaded gray area around the expected value, even though I think it's very important to communicate the fact that um, these things aren't certain. So it's it's, yeah, you know, data visualization is a science to some respects, but you, you also have to just consider how people actually consume information as well and how people might interpret it, good, good and bad. So yeah, as I've been blabbing on about, the common thread of all these things is ggplot2. 
So GTplot2 <laughs> is a package in R, because you've already used it yesterday, so you, you must be reasonably familiar with the name, at least, maybe. It's part of the tidyverse, which again, you used yesterday. Um, so there's a few reasons why that's good. I mean, the key thing, the, the, the key reason why ggplot2 is useful in terms of using R in general is that, yeah, it's compatible with the tidyverse. So a lot of the skills and the kind of intuition of what you used yesterday, it runs through to ggplot2 as well, because they're literally designed to be designed to work together. Um, another reason why ggplot2 is cool in a kind of, uh, not necessarily in an, in an R specific way, is that uh, the reason the GG and the GG plot stands for the grammar of graphics. So whilst we're you know, in this workshop, we are interested in learning the code behind GG plot two, okay? Because you have data that you want to use and you want to be able to visualize it. But actually data visualization is a whole field in itself. There's a lot of, um, a lot of research gone into how people consume charts, what, what chart designs are, uh, you know, most appropriate for certain things, what color palettes are most appropriate for certain things or certain people, because a lot of people have, um, you know, color deficiencies in terms of like color blindness and things like that. Um, what charts can be misleading, what charts can be inaccurate completely unintentionally. And a lot of this, a lot of this research goes into informing the grammar of graphics. The grammar of graphics basically being a framework for creating data visualizations. So just by using ggplot2 and just by following the framework and the code that the package gives you, you're already kind of in a good way, narrowing yourself down to the grammar of graphics and you're narrowing yourself down to creating visuals that will probably um, be appropriate for what you're trying to do. It doesn't mean you can just do whatever you want in ggplot2 and you'll create a fantastic visual but it does mean that it does give you a structure for creating visualizations that are consistent with the grammar of graphics and consistent with um, a lot of the research that goes on in data visualization. So it's kind of like, I don't want to say it cuts the corner because there's still a lot to think about, but it definitely does structure your thinking around creating visualizations and it gives you it gives you a, a good framework to start from, which is the grammar of graphics. And you can read up on the grammar of graphics. Uh, I would recommend it because there's just one, one paper, I can't remember when it came out, by uh, Hadley Wickham, um, who created ggplot. Um, and I would recommend just like just briefly going through that paper just to familiarize yourself with what the grammar of graphics is, because it's just quite a useful thing to know about. Um, I think I know. Yeah, I'll talk about the grammar graphics a little bit more. I will just check. Does anyone have any questions about what I've spoken about so far? I realize I haven't really spoken about R too much. Okay, yeah, Andy's, Andy's put some links to what Ian, uh, Ian being Essex, please. Um, Playing from Julius Galaxy A14. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd recommend looking at he, he does some, some really interesting stuff. And that there are other people out there in, in police forces in the UK that use R for this kind of thing. Um, you know, a lot of public sector bodies are like notoriously behind in IT related stuff. But I think a lot of people in the police are actually quite forward thinking about it. Um, so that's definitely something worth, worth looking into. I, I always love looking at practical examples of what people are doing because it's just inspiring in general. It's either motivating or it um, gives you ideas for your own work as well. Okay, so grammar graphics. I have until 11, right? Yeah, okay, so grammar graphics. Um, yeah, it's, it's okay. It's a package for creating graphics in R based on the grammar graphic. Okay, I've actually already put a link there. That's probably to the paper. Yeah, so there you go. So that's the paper, the Hadley Wickham paper. Journal of Computational and Graphical Statistics, 2010. Um, so there's a preprint of it there. Would, I do, do recommend you, uh, you take a look at that. It's quite interesting. Yeah, so a fundamental component of the grammar graphics is that graphics are made up of layers. Um, and this idea at first might not be that intuitive. So if you're used to, for example, creating graphics in Excel or in SPSS, um, the idea of layers might not necessarily be intuitive, um, but I think you kind of have to force yourself to get into the mindset of using layers. And I think 
hopefully relatively quickly, you'll realize that it's actually quite, it can be quite an intuitive way to think about graphics. And it's a very useful way of structuring your thinking about creating the graphic. So um, I will go through these in turn, but basically the first layer of the graphic is the data. So you have a data frame of rows and columns, and that's what you want to, uh, that's what you're going to try and visualize. Then you have the aesthetics, which are basically the variables of what you want to, uh, what you want to visualize. So on a basic level, that might just be the X and the Y. So if you're, if it's a scatter plot, for example, it's the X and the Y. And then the geometries are basically the shapes that you're going to use to convey that information. There are more layers to, to this thing, but these are the fundamental three that we're going to focus on today. Uh, and if that seems sort of abstract to you now, hopefully it will become slightly clear when we begin to go through the code. So I'm going to give you an example of using ggplot just in the just within the slides. Uh, but I will, before 11, I promise you, <laughs> I will actually open our studio and, and show you how to do this. Uh, but I will just go through this example quickly within the slides. So here we have a data frame, very, very simple data frame. We've got three variables called var1, var2, var3, and we've got five rows of information. So var1, var2 are just like numbers. So that could be, I don't know, age and income or something. And then var3 is what you might call a categorical variable or what's sometimes called a factor within R of like AA, AA. So that could be gender or something like that. So you might want to say, okay, what is the relationship between variable and variable two? We go back to our layers. So the, the first layer is kind of already done. We know that it's DF1. And in R, in order to specify that first layer, the function is ggplot. And all we do is we say ggplot and we say data equals DF1. DF1 being the name of the object in the R environment, as you've done yesterday, you know, when you loaded in data, you assigned it to an object called like my data or whatever. So in this scenario, DF1 is that data frame of three, col uh, three columns and uh, six, five or six rows. When you do that, you just get a completely blank space. But then slowly, and I, this will make more sense when I go through in our studio, slowly you basically build up the layer. So you've already laid out the data layer. Then you want to move on to the aesthetics, which are the variables. In this case, it's var1 and var2. So you add to the ggplot function, you lay down the first layer and you say data equals df1. And then we, what's called, you map the variable one and variable two to the aesthetics. And the, ma the mapping concept, it may, might be slightly odd, but basically you have these various different aesthetics. For now, let's just say the x and the y. The mapping you can just think of as basically like pulling out the variable you want and sticking it on the uh, on the on the x or the y axis. So the map the mapping are the is the aesthetics. And here we just say, okay, the mapping equals the aesthetics, x we want to be variable one and y we want to be variable two. And when you execute that code, you still haven't actually done anything yet, but basically this uh, basic graphic will appear in the plot window. And you can see it's grabbed variable one it's mapped var variable one from df1 and it's stuck it on the x axis. And then it's grabbed variable two, i.e. Ma mapped variable two from df1 and it's stuck it on the y axis. And all it's done is basically plotted the extent of those two variables. So like the max of var one is 12. So it's automatically made uh, the maximum of the x axis roughly 12. It's probably actually 13 or something like that. And then it goes up to around 17 on the y axis. But again, we haven't actually done anything yet. So we then have to think about the final layer, which is the geometry. So we know that our visual is going to have this x and y axis, but then what shapes are we going to use in order to betray the relationship between variable one and variable two? And I think intuitively, many people would say a scatter plot is probably what you're going to use. And in, in ggplot, a scatter plot is called, like, we refer to it as a point, basically. Um, so ggplot has loads of different geometries and they're always geom underscore and then something and a scatter plot is geom underscore point. So when we add that, it then, it's already got the mappings laid out of the X and the Y. And then you say, okay, I, the shape that I want to represent the relationship between variable one and variable two is the geometry of point. And then of course you can see that it fits the point on. We'll go through this with, with the prime data later on, but that's the, the general idea about what you do. 
when it, what becomes more interesting and kind of more exciting is when you look at aesthetics. So you can add different, we've, we've dealt with an X and a Y aesthetic, but you can also add stuff beyond that. So if you wanted to look at, for example, how variable three factored into this relationship, you can, you can use various different additional aesthetics. So we've already used an X and a Y, but you can also color there. You can also color things according to variables. You can fill in the color of things according to variables. You can shape them. You can size them. You can alpha them, if that's a word, but alpha basically being making things transparent. Or you can change, um, for example, like the line type. So it'd be like a solid line or a dotted line, whatever it might be. There are loads of different aesthetics. This is just an, uh, some examples of them. So if you go back to that data frame, you think, okay, how would we represent uh, the variable one in the scatter plot, and you, you, you look at these aesthetics, and I would probably say, okay, well, we could color each point according to the variable three. And then, okay, I say simply, it might not be, be simple at first, but you have the mapping of X and the Y, and then you just add this additional aesthetic of color, and you map it to variable three. So again, you pull out the information from variable three, and you stick it into the color aesthetic, and then you color the points according to a particular variable. And that basic concept, that not basic concept, but that concept is basically applicable to any type of data possible. Um, and the more you go through these exercises and the more that you uh, use very different, various different examples of aesthetics and different types of variables, the more you'll begin to think in this kind of like layered way of adding the data, mapping the variables that you're actually interested in to particular aesthetics, the aesthetics being the X, the Y and other stuff and then choosing what geometry, what shapes you actually want to represent this data with. Um, so with that being said, you can add other things. So for example, here I used, uh, I don't know why I'm pointing at my screen, you can't see. I used the color aesthetic, but you could also use shape. So if, I, if you just see the difference between these two screens at the top, all I've done is change color to shape, which basically means rather than coloring in the points by variable three, I want to shape the points by variable three. And by default, it chooses a circle and a triangle. If you've only got two different categories, um, it updates the legend for you and it said, okay, um, all AAs will be circles and all BBs will be triangles. And the great thing about this and the great thing about using that grammar of graphics and the layers is that there are loads of different geometries. So geom point we've dealt with, but there's geom bar for bar, bar charts. There's geom density for, you know, like a, basically a smooth histogram. Um, geom smooth, which is basically like drawing the line of best fit. But there's, there's dozens and dozens of different geometries. Um, and the structure is the same. Like all you have to do is get your head around that example that I just gave about mapping variables uh, to different aesthetics and then choosing your geometry. I say all you have to do, this might be, this will be challenging for some people, but you, you will get it eventually. All you have to do is get your head around that idea. And basically the same structure is applied to basically every single visualization in ggplot2. So this example here, these are just random examples. We've got a density plot, we've got a bar plot, but a bar plot that's been filled in by a variable as well. We have a scatter plot, if you, which if you remember is G on point, and then we have a map as well. All these visualizations were created basically with the same code. Like the, the, it, we're talking like a matter of one word, may, or one or two words being changed between these bits of code, and they create drastically different visualizations, which is why ggplot2 is so useful and why it's worth investing time in understanding how to use it even in a even in a sort of rudimentary way because just by altering a few lines of code you can create a huge diverse array array of visualizations and these visualizations will be consistent with the grammar of graphics they'll be consistent with an established like respected framework for creating visualizations so hopefully at the very least that persuades you <laughs> that persuades you that it's a cool and very useful thing to use Cool. So what I will do is so I will just give you a very quick example in 10 minutes of um, applying those skills to the data that you're going to be working with. So if I go on the um, 
if I go, actually, I, I won't show you the worksheet because you're going you're gonna to go through the worksheet already. But this is all completely uh, transferable to what you're about to do. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to load in a CSV file. The CSV file, you know, like an Excel spreadsheet, the CSV file you have already, um, you have access to. It's on the Dropbox and you will be doing this in a minute. Um, but I will just, I will load in the data and I will basically apply the same idea of data, aesthetics, geometry, but to the, to the real life data set. So I will first just load the packages that I know will be needed. And to try and make it clearer, I will just comment. I might zoom in a bit actually. Hopefully people, let me know if you can, if, if anyone can't see the font, uh, please let me know. I'll be just begin by loading in the packages. So I know that I'm gonna use, a package called read R, which is you might have used yesterday. It's in the tidyverse and it's just used for loading in, uh, loading in data, basically. And now I'm going to use read R and I know I'm going to use ggplot2. So the first thing I will do is just load in those packages. You might have to install them if you haven't already, but you probably do have them. Then I'm going to load the data. So I'm going to assign the data to an object called Burgery underscore df, which is that this is just my way of naming objects. I tend to put underscore and then whatever the type of object it is. And because I know it's going to be a data frame, I'm like Burgery underscore df, because that's the data that you're going to use. And I will use read underscore csv in order to get the, uh, in order to pull the uh, actual data. And the I think the CSV that you're going to use first is called GMP underscore 17 CSV. So you see it's loaded it in. Uh, I will then view this data just to show you what, what's actually in it. So what it is, it's basically LSOA level, LSOA being a neighbourhood unit in uh, England and Wales. So it's LSA, these are basically neighbourhoods in Greater Manchester. So for each LSOA, we have a burglary count, and I think it's the burglary count for the whole of 2017. We have the local authority that that LSOA is in. We have the IMD score, IMD being index of multiple deprivation. So that's basically how deprived the LSOA is. We have its rank in the whole of England. We have the decile of how deprived it is. And then we have the income score. The income score basically being a measure of income deprivation. So I'm pretty sure the higher, it's sort of counterintuitively, the higher this score, the more that the higher the income deprivation, the more deprived it is. So, if, for example, in this data set, and you're going to do this a bit later, you might, one of the first things I would be interested in if I was going to look at this data, just as an example, is the relationship between income deprivation and burglary. So we have what is it, 1,600 neighbourhood units in Greater Manchester. Um, and we have the burglary count for each one of these things and we have the income score. So basically, I would like to know what is the relationship between income deprivation and burglary. So in other words, are areas that have higher income deprivation more likely to be uh, have high burglary counts? Are they more likely to be to suffer from burglary victimization? Or other way, I think it could be that could be argued both ways. Are areas that ha are, have less income deprivation, so wealthier, are they more likely to be burglarized? Because perhaps like it's more attractive targets if you have a big house and lots of lots of fancy things. So to look at the relationship between those two variables, what they're both, you know, I think you could describe them as continuous variables. You've got a burglary count, which is like what one to 236, and then the income score, which I think is a I think is a percentage, but basically it's clearly continuous. There's lots and lots of different values to it. We want that, this is where we want a scatter plot again. So you can already begin thinking, you know what the, you know what the data is because it's burglary underscore DF. That's, that's gonna be the first layer that you input into your ggplot uh, code. Then you think, okay, the next layer is aesthetic. So remember with aesthetics, you're gonna be thinking, number one, what variables am I interested in? And number two, what specific aesthetics, i.e. X, Y, color fill, whatever it is, are we gonna be mapping those variables to? And in this case, because we've decided to do a scatter plot, we know that we're just gonna be using X and Y. So the data is gonna be burglary DF. 
the X intuitively will be the income score. And then the Y will be the burglary count. Just because typically people put the dependent variable on the Y axis, we know that we probably know intuitively beforehand that those are going to be our aesthetics. And because we kind of cheated a little bit already, we know that the geometry for a scatter plot is G on point. So you can go through this again. So we can just say, okay, like, I don't know, scatter plot one. And as, as per the as per the, the slides and the, and the framework for creating ggplot uh, code, you write the function ggplot and you say data equals burglary underscore df. So just as we did before, if I now run this, it does what it did in the slideshow for that mini uh, mini data frame. It, it doesn't do anything, but we have laid down the first layer. I, I like to think it's like laying out. Um, if you when you say date when you say ggplot data equals something, you're basically laying out the canvas for what you're about to do because like the plot window has been activated, like it's gone grey and it's basically ready to receive whatever information you want to give it. You want to give it. So the next stage, we've laid out our data. Then we want the aesthetics. So just, just as we did before, you say mapping equals aesthetics. And then the aesthetics we're going to be using are X and Y. So X equals, which was income score. Y equals burglary count. And sort of, if you look, because when you use that function, if you look on the bottom left, it tells you what variables were, uh, what variables were loaded in. That's how I knew what they were. I haven't got a, that good a memory. So if, an I, if I now run this, you're executing the first two layers because you, you've got the data and the aesthetic. So if I now run this, it's done as we expected based on the, on the little example I gave. It's laid down the X and the Y. So it's pulled, it's pulled out the X, which was income score, this variable here on the right-hand side. It's pulled that out and it's mapped all those variable, all those values of income score onto the X axis. And then it's pulled out all the values of burglary count and it's mapped it onto the Y axis. But currently we're still lacking the third and final layer, which is the geometry. So at this point, you add this little plus to the end. And the plus is basically how you add new layers to things. So I'll, I'll, after the break, I'll maybe do, in, unless you're sick of me talking, I will do another example where I basically add lots and lots of different layers to the ggplot. And you'll notice each time I do that, I put a plus sign at the end, which hopefully is quite intuitive because like you're adding something new to the plot. So I've laid down the data, I've laid down the aesthetic. Oh, then all I need to say is g on point. And if, if, you, if I write g on and don't do anything, it will give you all the different geometries that are, that are available. So some of these you'll be familiar with, like Geon box plot is a box plot, as you can imagine. If I keep going down, Geon density, we dealt with to look at distributions, uh, error bars for displaying uncertainty. We've got histograms. We have just a standard line graph. Uh, loads and loads of different stuff, but the one I want is Geon point. And if I go on GM point, you can see it says the point GM is used to create scatter plots. So if I just click that, it fills it in for me. And then I can run this whole bit of code. And to that, it's basically done exactly what we did in the presentation where with var one and var two, it pulled out the X of income, income score, it's pulled out the Y of burglary count, and we're betraying that information using the geometry of a point. 